The government has been reviewing the regulations that are meant to protect racing greyhounds from abuse. They were introduced in 2010 sorry, in response to a public outcry about the poor conditions that some dogs were being kept in, the injuries they suffered at the tracks, and how many of them were being dumped or destroyed once their racing days were done. The regulations set minimum welfare standards at 25 racetracks across the UK. All of the tracks have to be inspected by teams accredited by the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, or UCAS. The review found that a rule stipulating that all racing dogs must be identified through microchips and tattoos, that's done the most to raise standards. Henrietta Harrison has been talking to insiders about what more could be done, and she started at a dog track in South London where she met Simon Adams. He's chair of the Track Vet Association. In my 20 years as a track vet, it's been about a 500% improvement in, in serious injuries. Sand tracks vary greatly depending on how much water's in them, so getting the preparation of the track right to get the traction and keep it as consistent as possible is, is a very important job. A slippery track causes dogs to crash into each other. Obviously the track preparation is better and the dogs can maintain their way around the bends without knocking into each other, then they don't tend to suffer from very severe injuries like broken legs, this sort of thing. The new standards in welfare have been overseen by the regulatory body, the Greyhound Board of Great Britain, or GBGB. It's a system of self-regulation that's monitored by UCAS, but many welfare campaigners are still unhappy. Hello, hello. Clarissa Baldwin is chair of the Greyhound Forum and recently retired chief executive of the Dogs Trust. They certainly have done something to improve welfare, but they only take into account greyhounds while they're at the track. And when you take into account the fact that greyhounds spend 95% of their time in trainers' kennels, it really isn't covering welfare as we see it. A lot of the trainers are pretty elderly and science about looking after dogs has moved on tremendously. Uh, dogs Trust did some undercover work looking at nine trainers kennels. Three were okay, three were pretty good and three were simply ghastly, dark, dingy. The greyhounds were wearing muzzles the whole time, probably because two are together kennels. They're standing on feces that have quite clearly been there for two or three days. The kitchens were vile and the trainers were actually administering veterinary medicines to the dogs directly, which they shouldn't be doing. So there's a huge issue around the care and welfare and the inspection of these places. The number of dogs euthanised each year and the number of injuries that dogs sustain while racing are not published. Can you give me an idea of what you think those figures might be and why you think it's important that we do get access to these numbers? Yes, I think... Um, we're very concerned that the industry is opaque on this subject. Now, 8,000 greyhounds come into the sport each year, which sort of suggests 8,000 go out at the end of the year. What happens to those dogs? 4,000 roughly are looked after by the Retired Greyhound Trust. Other charities like Dogs Trust, RSPCA, Blue Cross take in um, uh, greyhounds and rehome them, but they don't take in 4,000. And this is a question we've put to the sport on a number of occasions and we'd like some answers to it so we can try and help. I took some of Clarissa's concerns to the chairman of the regulatory body, Tom Kelly. We're going to extend our kennel inspections into trainers' kennels at the moment we do it only on the track. This has been agreed with DEFRA and we will be seeking UCAS approval of the uh, new regime when it comes into force. Can you tell me why you don't publish the number of dogs that are put down each year? Well, we do collect uh, data on uh, the number of uh, dogs that are put down until such time as they leave the sport. Once they leave the sport, they come under the protection of the Animal Welfare Act. We have improved our collection of data. We have a new system now, and the data going forward from now on will be much better, more comprehensive, will include the types of injuries that are suffered and how many dogs have to be put down for compassionate reasons and we'll be sharing that with the appropriate people in the future. So how many dogs are put down each year? It's not something that I can answer at the moment. We'll have a year-on-year -year comparison in a year's time when this new database is, is, is fully functional. I mean, this is where there seems to be a bit of a problem that there, there's no real straight answers when it comes to 
the euthanasia figures? Yes, well, I can tell you that the figures are better than they were in the past. We're a bit like the, the law enforcement agencies. There's still crime going on out there, but there would be an awful lot more of it if it wasn't for the police. At our own level, um, there are still problems out there which we're trying to address. If we weren't here, it'd be a lot worse. I went on each way. Back at Wimbledon, bets are being placed on race number three. Yes, Excuse me, have you just put fifty pounds on a dog? Yeah. Have you? Oh, good luck. Which one did you put it on? Number one. Number one. Have you got some inside track on him no. doing well? No. So if, if he wins, what will you get? Another bet in the next race. Good luck. Who, are we, who are we looking out for? Bustina. Number one. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bustino didn't come first, meaning that bet was a win for the bookies. And it really is the bookmakers who are the big winners when it comes to dog racing. Not the independent bookies here on a Saturday night, but the high street betting shops and online betting sites who are fed a daily stream of greyhound racing for their customers to take a punt on. It's estimated they make 230 million gross profit from the sport and pay just 0.6% of every pound bet to the industry. And some don't pay at all. Well, we're in discussions about the betting industry. Uh, they're at a, a delicate stage, so I can't promise what we are or aren't going to deliver, but we are talking to the betting industry. I think we're convincing them that welfare and integrity two issues in particular that are of interest to them, and I'm hopeful that before much longer uh, we'll have some good news on that front. So are you pushing them to increase the voluntary levy, the, the 0.6 that they contribute? I would be happy if they increased the voluntary levy. I don't think it's the only way forward. I think the problem lies with the word voluntary because uh, although it used to be in inverted commas, I think the inverted commas have dropped off now uh, politically and not everyone pays it. I mean, we have a massive organisation out there called Betfair which doesn't contribute to the voluntary fund, for example. We have other bookmaking companies that do contribute on the retail business but not on their offshore business. So the high street betting shops that, that I know about, if I put a bet, say, through them on the internet rather than going down to the shop, I wouldn't be contributing to the voluntary levy. That's correct. If you bet in the shop, 93% of the shops pay the levy, which is a pretty good figure for a voluntary scheme. If you have a bet online, the only company that pays the levy on its online business is Bet365, which is a large company and its uh, contribution is very welcome. The others don't. The ABB, who represent the high street betting shops, not the online sites, say they pay £7 million a year to the sport through the voluntary levy and are open to further talks. And if more revenue is raised from the betting industry, it'll be the first time a better deal has been struck in 10 years. That's good news for the dogs and the crowd in Wimbledon who enjoy a night out at the races. Uh, we're on a date night, me and my husband, so we thought we'd come here for a night out. Just to do something a bit different? Yeah, just something different. A steak do, <laughs> yes. Just a good crack. Yeah, we've had a few beers, a bit of a laugh. Well, I haven't been for four or five years. Last time was in Glasgow and, and she's never been before. They don't have it in Brazil, so... We haven't won a, a jot yet, but... No, I won. Oh, no, you won yeah, ATP. Yeah, I won yeah. ATP. It's a good night out, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. Mm. <laughs> See the doggies and run around, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Lose money or win ATP. <laughs> no, 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 ATP, come on. <laughs> that was Henrietta Harrison reporting.